at the First Baptist Church of Bayshore, where our pastor is the Reverend Dr. Darius Dixon Clark. Let us stand those in the sanctuary and recite our Sunday school theme, which comes from 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. A gentleman by the name of Thomas O. Chisel wrote Living for Jesus, and the words seem so appropriate for this lesson. Living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please him in all that I do, yielding allegiance, glad-hearted and free. This is the pathway of blessing for me. O oh, Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to thee. For thou in thy atonement didst give thyself for me. I own no other master. My heart shall be thy throne. My life I give henceforth to live, O oh, Christ, for thee alone. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for the blessing of being able to study your word. We thank you, Lord God, for this assembly, for this sanctuary. We ask, Lord, that you would bless this lesson. I pray, Lord, that you would help me to teach it. I pray, dear God, that those in the sanctuary and those at home would receive your word and be blessed by it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This was a very challenging lesson. You may be seated. The Sunday school teachers, when we met to study it, went back and forth. And those, I won't name any names, but those who are not teaching today chuckled as they said, let's see what you do with this, Dr. Cornigans. The lesson is divided into four parts, divine power, discipleship priorities, diligent perseverance, and departure predicted. At the conclusion of this lesson, whether you're in the sanctuary or at home, you should be able to identify the resources God has given to Christians to live, live godly lives. We should be able to explain how we can use those resources to help ourselves lead godly lives and lead others to Christ. The lesson begins with 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. And it reads as follows. According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, although the author of this book does not name the recipients of the letter, it's most likely addressed to believers. Those believers are reminded that they have been given the power to live godly lives. And one of the things I'd like us to consider is what is it that believers have been given? What, what has God given us to allow us to lead godly lives? And I thought about going about this in, in different ways. I was going to call on people, and, but I won't put you all on the spot. I, I'm just going to give you some scriptures to discuss. First of all, in 2 Timothy, the third chapter, it tells us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, 
thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, this is the King James Version, so let me just jump right in here and say that the man or woman of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And it's important to understand that what we read in the Bible was written by individuals divinely inspired by God. And that what we read is profitable. That works to our good. And it's good for doctrine, knowing what we're to learn, what we're to do, for correction, for turning us in the right direction, for instruction in righteousness. So in other words, if you want to know what's right and wrong, we can always turn to the, to the word. The, thank you, amen, to the word of God. That's 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. So we have the word of God to help us live a godly life. What else do we have? Well, if you take a look at Acts, the first chapter, verse 8, it says, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the other part of the earth. So we've been given the word of God through the Bible. And we also have been given the And that power, I, I, I need a more definitive answer. I heard, I heard it somewhere louder. The Holy, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. King James says the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. So we have the Spirit of God within us. We have the Word of God. And then we turn around and we look at 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. And 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. There was a, um, a, a spiritual that used to go, I don't know how the whole song goes, but part of it is I looked at my hands and they were new. I looked at my feet and they were new. They were too. Um, you're not you're not the same and people notice that I had someone when I when I came to the Lord I had <laughs> I had someone who was still had both feet in the world turn to me and say ever since you came back from that church you ain't been right <laughs> people know they see there is a change you are a new creature in Christ and then in 1 John 5 and 4, it says, For whatever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. For we walk by faith and not by sight. People may try to argue with you, but you know that you know that you know God said it. I believe it. That settles it. When we lead godly lives, it results in glory, which is honor and praise, virtue, which is goodness in our daily walk. And this is a growth process. You don't get there overnight. Question to consider, what are the great and precious promises? These first two verses verses 3 and 4 and first in second peter chapter 1 verses 3 and 4 speak of great and precious promises well first john chapter 2 verse 25 tells us and this is the promise that he has promised us even eternal life eternal life that this place is this not our home and this is not the end. There is eternal life. And then in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, it says, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. 
Now, you have to think about this for a minute because, see, some people jump on, God's going to give me anything I ask for. And that's not what the scripture says. It's according to God's will. Just because you ask for it doesn't mean you're going to get it. And even if you get it, doesn't mean you're going to get it like that. God does not work like that. But God hears us. And there will always be an answer to that prayer. It may be yes. It may be no. It may be wait. But there's an answer. We're not just talking to air when we fall on our knees and pray. In Acts, the 10th chapter, the 43rd verse, it says, to him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. It's a beautiful thing to know that whatever you may have done in your life, when you come to Christ, you are forgiven. And another important thing is that if you know how to pray, because sometimes you slip, sometimes you say things you shouldn't say or do things that are, are not really a good witness. You can come to the Lord in prayer. You can seek forgiveness. Jesus is our intercessor. He sits at the right hand of God making intercession. You know, I like to imagine, now this is not the word, this is Linda. I like to imagine that when I do something, Jesus turns to God and says, you know, that dummy down there, she did it again. <laughs> Let's, she's begging for forgiveness. Let's forgive her. I just like to think that Jesus has a sense of humor. That's me. Romans 8 and 28. And this is a scripture that in my lifetime I've just had to grab hold of. You may have too. It says, for we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. It may not seem like it's working for our good, but it is working for our good. I was looking through some papers that I had, and I don't know, um, anybody here have some of their old report cards? I, I found one from second grade. And the first quarter, second grade, the teacher wrote at the bottom, Linda talks too much. I can't imagine what I had to talk about in the second grade, but obviously I was talking uh, too much, you know. But when you think about where you've been and where God brings you to and how he works things out, I, I probably, that's probably where God started working with me because he knew I was going to end up preaching. <laughs> so, in Acts 2 and 38, after Peter received the Holy Ghost and he preached, he said, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So we have the word of God, we have the spirit of God, we have the assurance, the assurance of eternal life with God, and we have the assurance that whatever is happening in our lives, Jesus will work it out. Now, what does it mean to be partakers of God's divine nature? What, what, what does that mean? Think about it for a moment. I'm, I'm going to hit you with some scriptures, but I, I'd just like you to think about it for a second. In 1 John, the third chapter, starting at um, verse 1, it says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purified 
himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither know him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. You know, whenever I think of this, I, I, I think of um, a praise song they sing. And we used to sing, when I woke this morning, I didn't have no doubt. I knew the Lord would bring me out. Victory. Victory is ours. We have victory in Christ Jesus. We have the precious promises of God. We don't become God, but we behave in a manner that is pleasing to God behavior that is consistent with the moral attributes of God. And what are they? Goodness, justice, veracity, which is truthfulness. God cannot lie. Wisdom and holiness. These are the attributes that we should emulate as Christians. The nicest thing that anyone ever said to me on my job and it gave me, it, I took heart with it because um, there was an incident and the, and the person said, I don't know what happened, but I know Linda and she doesn't lie. If she did it, she would tell you she did it. So I, I'm thankful for that because that shows a walk with Christ. Not that I'm perfect, nobody's perfect, but that shows striving to be like Christ. So to sum up part one, those first two verses, let me give you an example. When winter time comes, most of us will make sure that we put antifreeze in the car, make sure that level is right. Most of us, if we've got good sense, will make sure that we don't let the gas tank get down to fumes because when the temperature drops, if you don't have a sufficient amount of gas in your car, the gas line will freeze. You take care of everything pertaining to the car, but you get in the car and you get ready to drive. But what is it you have to do to make that car go? Got to do something. Ah, you got to start it which means you either have to stick a key in there and turn it or you have to push a button or you're going to be sitting in the driveway for a very long time. And it's that way in, in Christ. You have, to, 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 you have the power, but activating that power comes through trusting the Lord, walking as God would have us to walk, studying the word, calling on God to help. You can't, if you could do it all yourself, you wouldn't need Jesus. You need the Lord to help you. Okay, Sister Perry. Mm-hmm. 
vain glory, <laughs> providing one another, envying one another. Amen. Amen. And thank you because that is an excellent introduction to part two of the lesson, which is discipleship priorities. And that's coming from Second Peter, once again, the first chapter, verses five through nine in our expositor. And verse five says, and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance and to temperance patience and to patience godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. It begins with faith. If you're going to walk with the Lord, it begins with faith. Faith to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. It is impossible, according to Hebrews 11 and 6, it is impossible to please God without faith. And it's a growth process. When you first come, you, you ever notice when you first come to the Lord, it seemed like you'd pray and God would answer you just like that and you go, oh, this is great. And then after a while, the answers don't come as quickly. It's like with a, with a little little baby. If you have a two year old and they want something, they they gonna keep crying till they get it. It takes a while for them to mature to understand that when Mama says no, she means no. In the same way with us, we don't like to think of ourselves as being babes in Christ. But when you first come to the Lord, you are indeed a babe in Christ. Some of us stay that way longer than others. Some people actually go to the grave that way, but we, don't, we, won't, we won't aim for that. Okay. And then the scripture talks about virtue. Virtue being goodness, an attribute of God that we should model. It refers to moral excellence. Do the right thing. Some time ago, I, I preached a sermon on do the right thing. And it had to do with um, Paul, and um, he was returning a, a former slave, Onesimus. And I, I love the way Paul does things, because um, I think he and I would have gotten along real good. Because what he did was to write uh, to the owner of Onesimus, but he wrote it in such a way that it had to be read to the whole church. So it wasn't just a private letter between Paul and this one person. And, it, and, and the essence of the whole thing was, yes, Onesimus was a slave. He did run away, but he is now your brother in Christ. And when you think about it, there are people in our lives who may have done us wrong. They come to the Lord. They are saved. They are repentant. Are we willing to forgive? And by forgive, I mean forgive and forget and recognize them as a brother, a sister in Christ. It's not always easy depending on what that person may or may not have done to you. But God expects us to exhibit moral excellence. Knowledge. Knowledge comes from studying the Bible. But I learned something in very early in ministry. Um, Reverend McElroy came and did a seminar for the ministers. And he talked about how important it was, not just for ministers, for everyone, but he was addressing the ministers, to be well read. One of the things he said is, you know, it's all right to read Shakespeare. One of the things he said, it's all right to keep up with current events. The Bible truly gives us what we need for right living to enhance our faith and to guide us. 
But that doesn't mean that we should ignore what is written in the press or what is in the news. Because with the wisdom of God, when we ask for wisdom and discernment, we'll be able to look at that and discern good from evil. So we, we shouldn't just be with our head in the sand like an ostrich. We should be reading the word. We should be reading other books, literature, and we should be up to date on the current events of the world. Temperance, controlling our passions rather than being controlled by them. And I looked at that, this is interesting. Sometimes we think of temperance in terms of maybe people who fly off the handle and get angry, but temperance can refer to a number of things. Um, at midnight, I have an issue with temperance because that's usually when I remember that there's some chocolate ice cream in the refrigerator and you don't need to eat chocolate ice cream or vanilla ice cream at 12 midnight. So temperance is controlling that passion, whether it's um, in a behavior, an interaction of, of, type, of some type, whether it's what you're consuming in, in terms of food, whether how you're socializing, it, it can manifest itself in any number of different ways. But as Christians, we're expected to exercise temperance. That might mean turning off the TV. That might mean keeping the refrigerator door shut. That might mean that when you go to the supermarket, you don't need to go down the cookie and chip aisle. You need to stay where the fresh vegetables are. So, um, and, it, and it may mean that you have to um, separate yourselves from people who are determined to live contrary to the word of God. So you may have to re-examine your friendships. Patience. Patience involves endurance and perseverance and delayed gratification. You know, it's, it's amazing. You can be a Christian and, and have delayed gratification in terms of your finances. In other words, um, I, I want this item, but I don't have really enough money for it, and I, I'm not going to make a bill. I'm going to save, and I'm going to get it. But then in the same vein, we'll get down on our knees and ask God for something, but we want it now. Uh, I, 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 want, I want it now. So we have to have patience because, because God gives us what we need when we need it. And then the same scripture that we just read talks about godliness, piety, living like God, asking yourself, what would Jesus do? When you think about how people get involved in road rage, how people get involved in arguments, and how um, just you have to say to yourself, is this what God wants me to do? Is this the way I'm supposed to act? Brotherly kindness. It's all right to disagree, but brotherly kindness means disagreeing without being disagreeable. Everybody doesn't think the same. All Christians don't think the same. We have differences of opinion about things, even when it comes to doctrine and, and theology. Someone approached me, not they didn't approach me, but we were talking not too long ago, and I, I really didn't question them about what they believed. And out of the blue moon, they, they just seemed duty bound to let me know, well, I don't believe in the Trinity. And I was like, okay, <laughs> uh, we're not gonna argue this. You, know, you say that you're perfect, you know what I feel, so I, we, I'm not going through that door. Sometimes when people open a door that's destined to present an argument you need to leave them standing in the doorway because it's not going to take us any any place that's good and finally and and probably the most important charity and paul wrote about that in first corinthians chapter 13 i like verse 2 and it says and though i have the gift of prophecy 
and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. Love is everything. We are commanded to love our enemies and those that despitefully use us, which is not an easy thing to do. But I don't read in the word where it says it's easy. I read where this is what God would have us to do. Jesus died on the cross, and he died loving us. And some of us were not lovable. So summarizing part two, the blessings that come from abounding in the attributes that I've just spoken about. Elder Bruce, are you, oh, okay. Our superintendent's coming to speak. I love how Peter expresses himself. If we look back at verse 4, it says, Un It's given unto us exceeding and great and precious promises, divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But what I like to focus on is verse 5, the beginning, and it says, And these things, and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness. He says, give all diligence to add to this. The Lord gives us all that we need, but there's a part that we have to play. I remember uh, someone telling me, the Lord's not going to do your homework for you. So we have to add, we have to be diligent about this. We can't be slacking. Or we can't kick our feet up and say, well, the Lord will bestow that on me when he feels like it. No, there's a part we have to do. Giving all diligent. Be diligent about this. Be serious about it because the Lord is serious about what he gives to us. If, he's, if he knows that we can't handle it or if we're going to take it for granted, he's not going to bestow it on us. So we have to increase our faith. We have to increase our patience and all. But he says, be all, be diligent to add to your faith this stuff. Thank you. Good morning, Doc. Um, as Elder was just saying, you know, in this, in this relationship that we have with God, uh, it is not a, a mutual or mutually exclusive relationship. It is exclusive in that it is us and God, but we are not equals in this relationship. God is doing for us or has done for us that which we cannot do for ourselves, but we do have some responsibility and some obligations to fulfill. So understanding that equation, this relationship, you know, um, the expectations and the fulfillment and such. Philippians 2, work out your soul salvation. So there, you know, yes, we cannot earn salvation. It is provided through Christ. And as recipients of that, now we have some obligations. We have to work it out. Exercising faith. Um, a sermon I had done once, uh, virtuous reality. You know, not virtual reality, but virtuous reality coming out of Galatians. You know, these things are virtues. The godliness that we are to exercise, demonstrate, we have to live such that it is self-evident that we belong to God. If we, this lesson is about godliness, if we claim to be children of God, then there needs to be some evidence that we are. Of an apple tree is known by the fruit it produces. So we have to um, produce the harvest of righteousness. We need to be producing righteousness in how we live. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to part three of our lesson, 
This is verses 10 and 11 in um, the first chapter. Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye you, you do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The focus here is on perseverance. You don't give up. You keep on going. And what is it the choir used to sing? The road is rough and the going gets tough. And the mountains, they're hard to climb. But I made up my mind a long time ago to make Jesus my choice. You know, I'm not, I don't know a lot about athletics, but I did look at some of the Super Bowl. And I noticed that the, the, the little guy who does the kick it, no, no he's, he's not the quarterback, he's not the running back, he's not gonna tackle anybody. All he has to do is kick that ball and get it between the two poles. So what is he doing while everybody else is running on the field? He's over at the side practicing and practicing and practicing. And then I noticed in baseball, you got one guy up at bat, but the one who knows he's coming up next, what is he doing? He's back there picking up the bats, feeling the bats, getting the one that's right for him, and practicing his, practicing his swing. And the relief pitcher, Jim, my husband would be so proud, the relief pitcher, <laughs> what is he doing? He's back there practicing throwing, throwing the ball. And runners, have you ever seen a runner just get up and decide to run? What, what do they do? They walk, they stretch, they bend, and if you have ever pulled a muscle, you know exactly why they do that. I used to play racquetball, and I, and I, and I pulled something, and I went to, went to the doctor, and the doctor said to me, well, you either broke a rib or pulled a muscle. Either way, it's the same treatment. It's no need me x-raying you. So he just gave me medicine, and I had to wait until the medicine took effect. Now, I thought I had warmed up, but apparently I had not warmed up sufficiently. Are you a warmed-up Christian? Okay. <laughs> you got to warm up. Now, I recall in um, 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, that Paul wrote to Timothy. Now Paul was knew, knew that the end was near. And in verse seven, he says, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. I once heard a preacher, and he talked about the fact that there was going to be some Christians making it into heaven, but they were going to be a little bit bald-headed because they would not have their crowns. I don't know about you, but I want my crown. I don't want to be a bald-headed Christian. When I come to meet the Lord, I want to hear the words, well done. I want to know that I have done what God called me to do to the best of my ability. I, I'm sitting here and I, as I, I look at her daughter, I'm remembering Mother Holmes. Mother Holmes uh, joined this church uh, the, day, the year I was born. And she served faithfully. And even though there were times when she was not in the sanctuary, she was always a voice. And I see so clearly that voice in her daughters. 
And, and I just, you know, we all have an opportunity to leave a legacy. You want people to look back and say, you know, I remember that sermon. I remember what sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so said in Sunday school. That stuck with me. You want, I took an a in-service course one time, and one of the things that we had to do in this class was to write our own obituary. What will people say about you when you're gone? What do you think they're going to say about you? What will be on your, your tombstone? What is it that you want to be known for? Because see, you, you, you know, you're with the Lord, and usually it's left to relatives to write your obituary. But truth be told, you should be writing your obituary right now in the life that you lead and what you do and in the influence that you have. And sometimes in somebody's mind, you, your name might not be remembered, but they will remember you. I recall being at a church picnic and I may have, forgive me if you've heard this before, but I was at a church picnic with my brothers and sisters. Matter of fact, we had gone to an amusement park and it was time for us to have lunch. And they had one of the sisters in the church in charge of when the children came to get lunch. And when I came, she wanted to know if my mother had packed a lunch, and I said, yes, my mom packed a lunch. We have lunch for everyone. She didn't leave it at that. She came over to make sure that we actually had our lunch, because sometimes children won't admit when they don't have something. And then she helped us to open it, because she was really, she didn't say anything, but she was really checking to make sure it was going to be sufficient. That told me a lot about what church was like. That, that made church for me a welcoming place, a place I wanted to be. And I, I put this out here because this, this whole lesson is about walking in a Christ-like fashion, about serving the Lord, about being a witness. It's important to remember that in everything we do, whether we're dealing with adults, but most particularly, with our young people, that we want to be remembered as someone who cared, who, who gave a helping hand, who reached out. Doc, just to piggyback on what you said, you know, the, the, the title of this lesson is Blessing of Godliness. Is the blessing, yeah, the blessing is partly for us, but it's also the, the recipients of the blessings that, you know, and the godliness that we do. So it's not just for us. I'm okay, well, we'll be godlike and behave this way so that we can get ours, you know, in the great by and by. But on this side of glory, charity, love, there is a recipient of that love. And if the recipient does not receive that love, you know, charity, we give to charitable organizations. We are the givers and there is a recipient. Well, if there is no recipient of the love that we're supposed to, to give, provide, be, you know, it says God is love in First John and we are created in the image and likeness of God. So we are supposed to be love, produce love, give love, etc., share it. Well, if we don't have recipients of the love, is it really love? Mm -hmm. Then are we failing to be godly? So it's a lot easier to say we love someone than to show we love someone. And that's, that, that's food for thought. I'm going to move on now to part four, the last part of our lesson, departure predicted. And, and I found that um, interesting that they call it departure <laughs> predicted. What it boils down to is we're all going to leave here one day. We don't know the day or the moment or the hour, but we, we're, we're all going to be leaving here. Some of us will come down the center aisle and end up here. Some of us may be somewhere else, but we're not going to be here forever. 
verse 12 says, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. So what's happening here is the author is saying, you know, this, this, this tabernacle, this body, this house, it, it's going to be gone. When um, my grandmother passed away, my daughter was, um, I think she was about five or six years old, and we explained to her that grandma had gone to be with the Lord. And what she was going to see in the funeral home was, was really just a shell. That's not grandma. Grandma's with God. Well, being the type of child she was who was curious, and I think I, I mentioned this in my last sermon, she was all over that casket. <laughs> she, was, she was just all over. One of my relatives came to me and said, what is wrong with your daughter? Why is she climbing all over mama? And I know of other children who have done that in other circumstances. They don't have a fear, which is a good thing. But it's a reminder to us that we are going to be with the Lord and that what remains is what, what goes in the ground and ashes to ashes and dust to dust. So knowing that, we need to be very mindful of and, and just know. I mean, as you get older, you become more and more conscious of it. When you're young, you think you're going to live forever. You can do anything and, you know, you're going to live forever. But as you get older and you, and you get acquainted with Arthur and some of his friends, <laughs> you, you realize that, uh, you know, there, there are limits. But I like to look at um, Philippians, the third chapter. Philippians, the third chapter, verses 13 and 14 says, Brother, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You want to press on when you're tired, when you're weary, when you're hurt, and they're going, they're going to be hurts. If you say, if you're a Christian and you're living and, and doing what is in our lesson today, there are going to be people that are going to be upset with you. You're going to have a hard time. But this is the life that leads to Christ. This is the life that leads to eternal life with the Lord. And this is where you want to be. So, as I conclude this lesson, are there any comments? Because I'm looking to hear, after this, we've gone through this lesson, can we identify the resources that God has given us to live Christian lives? And can we explain how we can use those resources to help us lead godly lives. You're gonna make me stand up here and wait. Well, in the um, in the lesson talks about making our diligence and election sure. Like you were saying, when people when people look at our lives, they should see evidence of Christ in our lives. They they should see that. And 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 leaving someone something. I remember Deacon Coyne can share with us a book a um, long time ago. I think it was. Calling sharing, uh, it's talking about sharing Jesus. It's talking about dealing with the witness. And sometimes when you're in the street and you're sharing something with someone, they don't 
necessarily know where the scripture is so you can show them and you say oh well, what does this mean to you and then they can they can answer you so a lot of times they'll look at you and they'll see like okay this this at first they might want to get away from you but at first they're like this person is actually taking the time to share something like this with me this must be really important so let me hear it and and let me listen and see what they have to say, and then hopefully they can receive Christ from that. Okay. Thank you. I know you're all just ready to jump right up and, and share. I can't hear you. I said, I'm a babe in Sunday school, so I'm listening. And oh. I'm trying to uh, okay. absorb it all, take it in, and uh, apply it. So, so every time I come, I do learn something different, a new, uh, a renewed thing that we have to give all we Thank you. I, I know um, the people who are live streamed didn't get to hear that. Uh, but paraphrase it for me, please. <laughs> <laughs> Sister Reed wanted us to know that she feels she's a babe in Sunday school, but I know if her mother was here, she'd she say differently, but I, I won't go there. But, but she did say that every time she comes, she learned something new. And that in this lesson, she also learned about what we do here and what we do when we leave church. Is that, did I get that right? That's it. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Okay, are there any closing remarks? Okay. Well, before we do that, if I can, can I do our, our Black History Moment? This is um, African American History Month. And um, I get to talk about one of my favorite, favorite people. I have so many favorite people. I'm not going to do this to you. I was going to read this and then make you all guess who I'm talking about, but <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune was an outstanding black woman and a legend in her own time. Born in 1875, she was one of 17 children and the daughter of former slaves. She was the only member of her family to attend school. With $1.50, she founded what is now Bethune-Cookman College in Daytona Beach, Florida. She served as an advisor on the affairs of black people to four of the nation's presidents. Dr. Bethune recognized and acted upon the need for uniting black women in social planning and action on national and international levels. The founding of the National Council of Negro Women fulfilled the need for a united organization of black women with a powerful voice. In her last will and testament, Dr. Bethune left a unique legacy. It reads as follows. I leave you love. I leave you hope. I leave you the challenge of developing confidence in one another. I leave you with a thirst for education. I leave you a respect for the use of power. I leave you faith. I leave you racial dignity. I leave you with a desire to live harmoniously with your fellow man. 
I leave you finally a responsibility to our young people. Dr. Bethune passed away in 1955, but the words of her will and her life speak to us today. Let us remember what she has left us in her will and let us meet that challenge. Another announcement, our superintendent wants us to know that the books for the next quarter are available. Please see him at the conclusion of Sunday School. That being said, let us stand for our closing prayer and the um, blessing of the offering. Dear Lord to heaven, I thank you for the students who came out to the sanctuary today and for those who listened live stream. I thank you for this lesson. I pray that the words that we have studied will dwell richly in our hearts and that we will continue to grow in grace and knowledge of your word. Have your way in our lives, Lord God. Have your way in this church, dear God, and help us in Sunday school, Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you bless the offering that is to be taken. Let it be used, dear God, for the upbuilding of your kingdom here on earth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.